Hi everyone, my name is Jasmine McCoy. Welcome to the video. I am a senior at Harvard University and I just got all A's last semester. So that is something that I worked really hard for and I was really proud of everything that I was able to turn in in order to get those grades. And I'm getting ready to read one of the final essays that I wrote. This one is for a class called The History of African Americans from the Slave Trade to the Civil War. And for this video, I am literally just going to be reading what I wrote. So to the left, which for you, the viewer will be the right, I will try to put in some screen caps of what it is that I'm talking about, not like the full scenes, but I will put in screen caps of what I'm talking about. That way you can have a visual uh, aid of what it is that I'm talking about, especially if you haven't seen the movies. Also, the prompt is going to be down in the description. That way I can just jump right in and start reading. The title of my essay is Violence as a Necessary Component of Movies About Antebellum Slavery, Evoking Desire for Freedom and Representing History Accurately. From the movies The Birth of a Nation to Antebellum, slavery has had a constant position in the spotlight since the start of projection entertainment. Movies about antebellum slavery cover a range of themes, revolution, love, hope, but it would all be incomplete without violence. This is a prerequisite in creating visual narratives surrounding America's original sin. Violence, who enacts it and who it is enacted upon, has flipped over 100 years in visual representations of antebellum slavery. In the earliest adaptation, The Birth of a Nation, Blacks enacted violence upon whites and justice came when the whites became free from Black oppression. Now, the violence is enacted by whites against Blacks, and justice comes when the Blacks are free of white oppression. Consequently, the way in which violence is presented on the big screen has evolved to reflect who the mainstream audience desires freedom for while presenting a more historically accurate narrative of antebellum slavery. As America's first blockbuster, The Birth of a Nation remains the most controversial film ever made in the United States for its blatant relabeling of who is the oppressor and who is the oppressed. The movie is split into two parts, Civil War of United States and Reconstruction, though more accurate titles would be anti-Northern propaganda and anti-Black propaganda. With a runtime of over three hours, there are two scenes that stand out among all others for the incredible violence that all white audiences would have witnessed the chase between Gus and Flora, and the trial of Gus at the hands of the Ku Klux Klan. In the chase, Gus, a black man, is presented as animalistic, like a predator stalking its feeble prey, Flora, a white woman. Not a single sexually aggressive action is captured on film, but the mere threat of physical contact from a black man is enough for Flora to throw herself off a cliff. By today's standards, the most violent part of the scene is the fact that the impact of Flora's body with the boulder is not censored in any way. For the all-white audiences that would have been able to see the movie upon release in 1915, the violence of the scene lies in the perceived sexual predation of a black man on a white woman. The focus is violence done by blacks onto whites. This is the fear white Americans irrationally felt would befall them due to Reconstruction. The birth of a nation takes that fear and places it on the big screen, thus making it real. The reason why birth of a nation is allowed to have such a presence in American film history and by proxy American popular culture can be explained by Professor Brown. The films that you remember are the films that make you feel something. One of the things that you feel most strongly is fear and terror. Consequently, White audiences' fear of being the victim must be quelled. They need to be saved from the alien feeling of inferiority being pushed onto them by the chase scene. Thus enters the Ku Klux Klan during the trial scene. They capture Gus, try him for the crime of causing Flora's death, kill him and dump his body on the porch of the governor's house, all while rousing music is played as the roped Klan members ride off after a job well done. In the eyes of white audiences, justice has been restored by a hero 
possessing all of the white supremacy that was formerly removed from them in the last scene. The birth of a nation shapes historical understanding of antebellum slavery by feeding white audiences a viciously racist, violent advocacy of doing whatever it takes to hold black people down. The next great work of American cinema, Gone with the Wind, handles slavery in a completely different way. By erasing the violence that was done onto enslaved people in order to paint a rosy retrospect of nostalgia for a genteel antebellum life before it was taken away by the North. How could slavery be recognized for the violence it truly was when pushed behind the plot line of a Southern belle struggling to find love during the Civil War? Contrary to The Birth of a Nation, Gone with the Wind does not feature any outright physical violence by whites against blacks. In fact, it's mostly white on white violence that is pushed to the forefront. The money shot of this movie comes when Scarlett goes off to search for Dr. Lee at the car shed. It starts with an upshot of Scarlett, paying more attention to the ruins of a burned building in the background than her small face moving at the bottom of the screen. Then the camera pans alongside her while she weaves through Confederate wagons, horses, and gurneys. Finally, the camera catches the horror on Scarlett's face as she breaks into the city center and moves deeper into the mass of wounded Confederate soldiers laying on the ground as a sorrowful orchestra plays in the background. The camera pans out over the course of about 40 seconds showing rows of wounded men reaching for the tender hand of a white woman and only ends when the tattered Confederate flag comes into view. Maybe this scene is supposed to build sympathy for the Southerners that were simply fighting for states' rights. That sentiment fails because as Mr. Rhett Butler states, all we Southerners got is cotton, slaves, and arrogance. Modern audiences and audiences from 1939 know this very well. Southerners fought the Civil War for states' rights to continue slavery. The fact that Mr. Butler's assertion comes so early in the four-hour movie diminishes the rosy filter of Southern nostalgia. Gone with the Wind's sin on history is that it attempts to blur slavery out of focus. The violent, nitty-gritty details aren't clear, so the audience is left with a watered-down version of the real thing, which favors Southern heritage and pride. Contemporary movies, like Django Unchained and 12 Years a Slave, push the violence done by whites onto enslaved blacks in front of the camera's eye, forcing modern audiences to see what The Birth of a Nation tried to rewrite and what Gone with the Wind attempted to erase. Observe the content rating flashing at the beginning of the films. The older pair are rated PG, and the newer movies are rated R for strong graphic violence throughout, a vicious fight, language, and some nudity, or violence, cruelty, some nudity, and brief sexuality by the Motion Picture Association of America. In order for the story to be told truthfully and respectfully, the violence is so inescapable that contemporary movies about antebellum slavery are tame if they can get released with a PG-13 rating. The violence on screen allows modern audiences to see a genuine representation of slavery after so many years of Hollywood getting it wrong. Over the years, the use of color has expanded with our knowledge of projection, lending to the evolving use of black and white, and most recently, red, in scenes of violence. The two scenes that a movie about slaves needs is a runaway escape and a public whipping to truly be complete. Out of this violence, we get some very important camera shots focusing on the back and face of enslaved people. While rape and castration have edged their way onto the screen with varying degrees of explicitness to remind viewers that even a person's most intimate sexual experiences were violently controlled by another person. With every violent act that passes on the screen, the audience is exposed to historically accurate depictions of slavery that bolster viewers' desire for the enslaved character to reach freedom. Though The Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind differ in the fact that one was made before the advance of Technicolor and the other was not, both use the color range afforded to them in a way that emphasizes the differences between white and black people's skin. In The Birth of a Nation, the whites of Gus's eyes stand out against his black painted skin as he emerges from the forest like a dangerous animal. 
They are so bright in comparison to his unnatural skin tone and the shadows of the forest, which are essentially the same color due to the limited monochromatic scale, that viewers feel pierced by his gaze. At the moment when Gus is surrounded by the KKK for his trial, audiences bear witness to more than 15 robed Klansmen swarming a vulnerable Black man on his knees. The shape of his blackness takes up less than 10% of the screen at the bottom center in comparison to the white of the Klansmen. The way white dominates the screen is a reflection of the white superiority enforced by the KKK. Thanks to Technicolor, Gone with the Wind holds a vast range of skin colors for white people. Visual observation proves white people's skin is not actually white, from Scarlett's peachy fair skin to Mr. Butler's enticing olive. The camera catches it all. But in the casting of the few black characters there are, all of them have the same shade of deeply melanated skin. It looks as if the casting director tried to retain the element from older movies, which was created by blackface, that black people's skin is actually black. This is a callback to the harmful representations of white people posing as black people for comedic or slanderous effect. For the white viewers preceding the civil rights movement, the darkness of black people's skin alienates them as subhuman and therefore unworthy of freedom. Django Unchained takes a radical step in the use of red by turning it against white people and their symbols of power to cinematically take down the ideologies of white supremacy and provide representation of the resistance against slavery. As a movie directed by Quentin Tarantino, red is used quite liberally in Django Unchained. Essentially, it is a revenge fantasy. The climax of the movie comes when Dr. Schultz kills Monsieur Candy and Django jumps into action, killing every white person in the vicinity, 17 in total. We get to hear the unusual sound of white men screaming in fear as a black man takes them out on sight. Accompanying the screams of white folk is the funk and gangster rap mashup song Unchained, The Payback and Untouchable by Tupac featuring James Brown. By the end of the scene, blood is splattered all over the walls, floors, Django's clothes, and the bodies of the white men at his feet, like it's a Jackson Pollock painting. Whites just lost in a 17-on-1 gunfight. That's going to make them question their superiority. But the two most poignant scenes where they use red come when blood is splattered onto some fluffy white cotton and when blood covers the white and cream walls of Candyland. It has soiled King Cotton and desecrated the pristine untouchability of the Big House. The crop that turned societies with slaves into full-fledged slave societies and the physical manifestation of the wealth from that transition have had their power stripped away by the spilling of white slaveholding blood. In doing this, modern films impact our historical understanding by asserting freedom from slavery and its ideologies of white supremacy is worth fighting and killing for. Conversely, running away was a radical act of resistance to slavery as well, which feeds into the necessity of an escape scene as seen in Django Unchained. Abolitionist James Miller McKim spoke to an audience in 1853, where he talked about the fugitives that arrived at the anti-slavery office in Philadelphia. In his interviews with them, he noted, the desire for freedom, not the brutality of individual owners, led to escapes. In Django Unchained, the escape scene is cross-cut with a whipping scene. As the slave catcher's dogs can be heard closing in, Django and Romhilda clutch each other in a tight embrace and look lovingly at each other's face before sharing a kiss. Then the camera points at the two as they run across an open field, while the torches of slave catchers on horseback get brighter and brighter behind them. The use of an open field is necessary to convey the expansiveness of the world that lies beyond the plantation and a life in chains. During the shot, we hear a woman singing, I'm looking for freedom, looking for freedom, and to find it costs me everything I have. Yes, Django and Romhilda are running from slave catchers, but they are running to freedom, and they are doing it together. Running away isn't about the pain and bondage that lies 100 miles back, but it is about the joy and freedom that lies a thousand miles ahead. 
The chase scene provides representation for the between 1,000 and 5,000 escapees per year between 1830 and 1860, who emancipated themselves. Chase scenes are essential to our understanding of history for their ability to convey the refusal to be content with being treated as property and the longing for a place where freedom for all is more than words on a page. 12 Years a Slave perfectly captures everything a public whipping scene should convey to disgust audiences with the brutality white people regularly enacted on blacks during slavery, ultimately causing viewers to wish for their freedom. In the notes of Still and Gay, among the causes mentioned for running away, by far the most common was physical abuse. One had even been struck 400 lashes by the overseer. When someone searches slavery in Google Images, they will get a wide range of slaves picking cotton or being corralled on a slave ship. But the one that is constantly repeated is whipped Peter. If you've opened a US history book, you've seen this picture. That's how iconic it is. In 1863, Peter escaped from a plantation, made his way to the North where he joined the Union Army, and had his picture taken during the medical examination. His picture became one of the most widely circulated images of slavery of its time, galvanizing public opinion and serving as a wordless indictment of the institution of slavery. If one picture can do all of that, imagine what 24 frames per second can do. Take the whipping scene in 12 Years a Slave, which is the most explicit part of the movie. Overseer Treach brings Patsy to the whipping post. He tears the dress off her back. Master Epps hesitates because he has a soft spot for Patsy. So Master Epps tells Solomon to whip her instead. He does it weakly. Mistress Epps then goes Master Epps for being soft. Master Epps threatens Solomon with a gun that if he doesn't do it correctly, then all the other slaves in the area will die. Solomon then starts whipping Patsy for real, but soon stops. Master Epps takes the whip from Solomon and does it himself. Solomon says, in the course of eternal justice, thou shalt answer for the sin. Master Epps denies it because she is his property. Then he walks away with Mistress Epps and Solomon removes Patsy from the whipping post. That is five uninterrupted minutes, a continuous take of the camera catching this violence. 7,200 individual frames of the violence enacted by slavery. It is intensified by the sound of the whip cutting skin, the spray of blood off Patsy's back, the screaming and crying from Patsy as she takes the punishment. Beyond the visuals, it's the length and sound of the scene that enforces how much of a spectacle a public whipping is. For Mistress Epps, it is entertainment. But for the 17 other slaves in the background of the scene, it is a grave warning of what could happen to them. For the audience, they are made to sit through the sickening violence and unable to do anything as if they are another character watching it all unfold. Whipping scenes are able to do what the picture of Whipped Peter did in 1863, but more effectively, by providing the audience with a colorized, audio-visual reenactment of the horrors of slavery. 12 Years a Slave, and Django Unchained emphasize who the violence was directed upon during slavery by having the camera focus on elements of the black body that were affected by the violence they endured. By seeing the open wounds and scars, this engages people's sympathy that no person should experience that type of pain. The back shot appears in two forms, to show the immediate damage of a whipping or to show the scars once they have healed. In 12 Years a Slave, there are three of the first kind and two of the second kind. The savageness of these attacks on the sturdiest yet most vulnerable position of a person's being is a crime against humanity. Modern audiences wish for the perpetrators to be punished, but that has no way in changing the past. We are only consoled by the words of Solomon, thou devil, sooner or later, somewhere in the course of eternal justice, thou shalt answer for the sin. Django Unchained places immense focus on facial scars from branding. As punishment for attempting to escape, both Django and Brumhilda have been branded on the face with the runaway R. The movie shows a flashback, 
of Brumhilda being doused with water and the red-hot brand being pressed into her cheek as the audience hears the sizzling of burning skin and her screams. Throughout the entire movie, we are reminded of the presence of this R and the branding that accompanied it because the camera continually shoots close-ups of Django and Brumhilda's faces from the right. It takes a certain kind of wickedness to maim someone's skin by branding in a way that is different from a whipping. With scars on the back, they can be hidden by clothing, but the face is often left uncovered. Historically, this makes the transgression of the person who wears the scar known to whites, which labels the slave as a troublesome property. For the audiences of today, though, it marks the slaveholder as someone who proudly broadcasts their barbarity for the world to see. As moviegoers take in the physical evidence of violence caused by slavery, they conclude, scars say more about the person who inflicted the wound than they do about the person who wears it. That those scars can only be made by a devil, not a human. Contrasting sexual violence in The Birth of a Nation with 12 Years a Slave and in Django Unchained, we see how imperative it is for this painful historical accuracy to be realized on screen. During the chase scene in Birth of a Nation, Gus touches Flora's arm twice. That was enough for Flora and all white audiences to fear for her chastity. Two gentle touches to the arm was all it took for the lie of black men raping white women to become real. 23andMe has since proved European men contribute three times more to the gene pool of modern African Americans than black men, while enslaved women contribute 1.5 times more than European women. Now it seems that modern movies are making up for the historical inaccuracy of the birth of a nation by including the sexual violence done onto black women and men with varying degrees of explicitness. In 12 Years a Slave, Master Epps rapes Patsy. The camera only shows them from the chest up to maintain some bit of modesty. Viewers can see their bodies moving back and forth. That's all the audience needs to know what is happening. The final shot is of Patsy lying alone on the wood pile with her dress hiked up her thighs as she breathes, though she looks almost lifeless for how still she is. Throughout the entire thing, Patsy isn't fighting back. She doesn't make eye contact and she doesn't make a sound. The scene emphasizes the powerlessness black women held in the face of white men's lust. Patsy has resigned herself to this fate because everything right down to her sexual intimacy is owned by Master Epps. It is his to take as he pleases, though when white men take from black men, it is not done for sexual pleasure. It is done as punishment for wrongdoing and comes in the form of castration. In Django Unchained, Django almost gets castrated. Django swings from his feet, naked save for an iron muzzle. Billy Crash walks up to him with a hot knife and tells Django, time to say goodbye to those nuts, Blackie. And the audience is graced with full frontal, not once, but three times. The first time is from the front to see Billy holding Django's shaft in the left hand and the knife poised in the right. A second time to witness Django curling in to see his testicles for the last time while he screams in anticipation of the pain. Then for the last time, when Billy walks away, but not before letting his fingers stroke over Django's testicles in disappointment that he won't be able to take them. The full frontal views of Billy's hand on Django's genitalia read, if I want to take them, then I will, because that is my right as owner of your body. They may be connected to you, but they are mine. The fact that modern movies depict acts of sexual violence as they actually would have occurred reveals how non-existent bodily autonomy was for black people while refuting the lie spread by Birth of a Nation. Movies about antebellum slavery would be missing an integral part of their being if they did not include violence. Though the roles of oppressor and oppressed have switched between Birth of a Nation and later films like Django Unchained or 12 Years a Slave, someone must be harmed to push an agenda. In 1915, it was white supremacy and the KKK. But now the agenda is that enslaved people deserve freedom and Hollywood should keep the violence against blacks historically accurate. Escape scenes pull at everyone's desire to be free and whipping scenes engage a person's sympathy upon seeing another in pain. 
Shots of a slave's face and back show the wounds and scars of slavery as they really existed. So the rosy retrospect created by Gone with the Wind is seen for its comical inaccuracy of happy slaves. By sticking to those cinematic conventions of violence, movies about antebellum slavery can lead Americans in recognizing our bloody past as a nation and the hopes that we can learn from those transgressions. And that was my essay. Thank you very much for watching this video and I will see you in another. Bye.